also i recall that uh, in my industrial engineering chemistry uh, course i touched upon uh, you know the work of on lithium ion uh, battery uh, maybe i'll cover it from a uh, from a little different perspective and from the uh, uh, from the nobel uh, lectures uh, and tell you how exactly the lithium ion uh, uh, battery uh, was uh, developed you know it's become one of the greatest uh, inventions uh, it's also interesting that you know uh, uh, you take someone like uh, elon musk uh, who uh, who kind of revolutionized the uh, use of uh, uh, these electric batteries and electric vehicles uh, you know he was the one who uh, really uh, in a way brought uh, uh, the lithium ion battery applications uh, stretching it from uh, Uh, from uh, laptop and mobile uh, to actually uh, uh, big vehicles okay. so so that has been a, a, a an important contribution uh, now let us uh, just quickly uh, see you know it's always very important to know that the lithium ion battery is just an innovation okay. battery has been was invented uh, in 1799 by volta who made the first battery it had its origin uh, in uh, what was uh, the famous experiment of galvani uh, where uh, a dead frog uh, suddenly seemed to uh, jump alive uh, you know when these wires were uh, connected to the frog okay. and uh, and and it was called animal electricity because it was felt you know the animal uh, was really uh, uh generating this uh, uh this power uh but later on uh, people realized uh, that actually what happened uh, was that you know two different uh, types of clips uh, were used you know different metals and the wire provided the conducting pathway and the frog uh, which was uh, probably freshly killed or uh, what i don't know but uh, it was uh, really the source of electrolyte you know so it allowed ionic conductivity so that was really the uh, role of the frog it was just a ionic conductor you know, and it completed the cell uh, reaction uh, which took place uh, between these clips which were of different uh, metals you know and uh, later on of course uh, volta uh, made the first battery uh, very uh, uh, really in the anode Uh, he was able to convert zinc into zinc two plus, generate electrons, and at the cathode he used sulfuric acid and converted protons into hydrogen. You know? uh, that that's what uh, uh, what Volta did, and uh, it was such a famous and radical departure because this was the first time uh, that uh, uh, you know the concept of converting chemical uh, energy. into electrical energy had been mooted <coughs> that was the importance of of this okay and then uh, you know just like uh, we learned about uh, uh, how you can uh, increase the voltage by taking many cells in uh, uh, series you know so he made a voltaic uh, pile and uh, that's exactly what uh, electric eels do you know they've got millions of these uh, uh tiny tiny cells each one generating maybe less than maybe a microvolt of power you know and totally uh, they can give you a terrible shock okay? because there's so many of them uh together and then of course uh, came faraday uh, and the laws of electrolysis which you are familiar with you know these are the three people uh, who got the uh, nobel prize who shared it they would uh, credit Uh, much of it to uh, uh, Stanley Whittingham and also his uh, supervisors, uh, both in Oxford and uh, Stanford. You know. uh, and uh, this uh, Nobel Prize uh, is uh, is a great example of complementary contributions. You know, I mean, sometimes it's very difficult to make out what exactly did the uh, other people do. Okay, uh, sometimes it's an extension. uh in fact uh, we'll discuss uh, uh, they they expand the scope of a uh, uh, invention uh, but in this particular case is not expanding the scope of the invention it is 
making the invention better. Uh, that's what uh, uh, both of these people uh, did, good enough and uh, Yoshino. Now, I've also put over here the, uh, the links to their uh, Nobel lectures. Uh, so you can go and uh, uh, you know, uh, hear them speak. Okay, uh, these are the three uh, Nobel lectures. Uh, now, uh, uh, you know, uh, what I thought is that first, uh, let me uh, take uh, a slide from uh, uh, Goodenough's lecture, okay, Nobel lecture. And uh, it's a very no nonsense uh, uh, thing that he says. He's, he's not uh, getting into deep science or anything uh, in the beginning. He's basically articulating uh, what really determines the choice of a battery. If you were to uh, imagine a battery uh, for tomorrow, uh, what are the kinds of things that uh, uh, you would look at? You know? And uh, I think uh, now uh, what I would do perhaps is uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, add uh, something else. Uh, I will say I would look at uh, this could be a huge opportunity which is not mentioned. How long will the battery go on before it is discarded? Before it is it is recharged or discarded. Uh, but the, the reason why I say sir, this it, yeah. Sir, isn't that point number four the life cycle? No, it's not the same. Uh, you know, like this is cycle life means uh, how many times can I reuse it? Okay, that's that's what it is. Okay? How many times of uh, discharging and charging? Here I'm talking about how long will it last uh, before I need to recharge? You know, and uh, you can say it is energy, but it's not quite energy. Like say, if I have a pacemaker, you know, I put in my body. If it can last for the life of the uh, pacemaker, you know, uh, then that's great. Yeah? And I don't have to do anything. Uh, so uh, that's the kind of thing. Or if I'm in a very long duration flight, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, Mars, you know, and I need a battery. Okay? Uh, I, that's, that's the kind of application I'm talking about. Is that clear? Yes, the sir. difference? All right. Uh, so, you know, what you can see is in a very no-nonsense way he's talking about cost. I mean, that's very important. A battery has got to be cheap. Uh, why a battery? Everything has got to be affordable. You know, it, it should be inexpensive. Uh, it should have uh, a high energy content per uh, per weight, you know. Uh, so that is the specific energy, you know, the how many watt hours of energy you have uh, per kg, okay. The third is uh, probably more important than energy is power. You know? What is the peak power at which I can run this thing? And remember that when I'm talking about power, uh, I'm really talking about voltage multiplied by current. Okay. And uh, so that's joules per second. And uh, so if you have, uh, let's say, uh, uh, you know, you're starting a car in the uh, early morning, you know, uh, and it, it draws a huge amount of power to uh, start the car. Uh, and if you can't, doesn't matter how good the energy content is uh, in the in the battery, it's not going to be uh, that useful. Okay, it will be a dud. So uh, I think uh, I hope you can see uh, how important power is, you know, that is the rate of uh, uh, discharge of uh, uh, energy. Okay. Uh, uh, cycle life is, of course, very important. I mean, uh, you want it to last for thousands and thousands of uh, cycles when you're talking about a, a rechargeable battery. How many times does it discharge and I can recharge, you know? Uh, you'll usually find that after a couple of years, you know, you're having to change your battery. Some of the batteries are really good nowadays. I mean, you can, uh, uh, you have no problem for about four or five years, you know. Uh, but there are others I've seen within a year is gone. Uh, so, uh, uh, cycle life is very important. Safety. You see, I mean, when you go to draw a high amount of power, okay, and what it means is that for a given voltage, I'm trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
derive more current you know from the uh, from the unit and you also know that uh, the heat that is generated will be i squared r you know so if the resistance of the battery the internal resistance is high and you are drawing a lot of current okay and that square i squared r uh, is the amount of heat that is uh, uh, released uh, then you know i mean it can reach a temperature where it can ignite uh, so uh, uh, you know safety is a, a, a very big uh, issue and so is the environment okay uh, because you know as long as you are using the battery that's great okay i mean uh, you are discharging charging everything is fine moment it has become uh, useless you know uh, that uh, it's it's uh, uh, is not efficient and it's not charging up properly uh, then it is, you have to do something with the battery now a battery by itself most of the batteries are if you have to just discard them they will be treated as hazardous waste because they have a lot of uh, uh, metals heavy metals you know uh, so it's not easy to discharge a battery and so uh, uh, you you may have to recycle you know all of these uh, uh, metals etc in the battery you know or you have to dispose of them in a efficient way obviously recycling would be a great idea because uh, like for example in india we don't have any uh, lithium source okay so if you have to do something with lithium Uh, either it will have to be imported from somewhere or of course we have got a huge base of uh, uh, mobiles one of the largest in the world okay and uh, so you know you can imagine how many uh, phones are going dead every uh, year you know and uh, so if you can recover let's say the lithium from uh, from that then that would be a, a, a probably the best resource uh, for us you know so those are the kinds of uh, Uh, issues and aspects that are related to the uh, environment you know and that's why it's very very important to do sustainability studies you know i mean because people just talk like if you're talking about an electric uh, uh, vehicle you know it sounds great oh electric vehicle you know there's no pollution where are you getting your electricity from most of the electricity is derived from coal burning of coal okay? it's not from uh, Uh, solar energy and this that i mean that's a small proportion but the bulk of it about 80% is from uh, from coal okay? and and so uh, you know all you have done is you have shifted the problem elsewhere you may have shifted it from the uh, cities to uh, uh, some uh, semi rural uh, areas okay? but you have not really overcome the problem okay? you are still generating carbon dioxide it's still generating pollutants is just that we have been become more selfish in the cities we we want to look okay you know and pass on the problem somewhere else so uh, i think that you know it's uh, very very important that uh, you look at all things you know uh, end to end because once you do end to end kind of an analysis you'll invariably find opportunities for innovation but if you get uh, kind of uh, deceived by uh, some of the propaganda uh, around these things you know you you'll take a different view you know you'll uh, more or less uh, parrot what everybody else is saying okay uh, but i think be a skeptic you know and uh, ask yourself always the question oh i've heard all the great things about it tell me what is not good about it that's a great way of uh, inventing okay now Uh, all of us uh, know that there are uh, effectively uh, two kinds of uh, batteries okay. earlier most of the batteries were primary batteries the disposable uh, batteries they are once of use i mean you use it uh, that that's the kind of thing you know we have uh, like uh, those of us who use a mouse uh, with a with a battery you know that asl i mean every time that asl within a month it's gone your mouse you know and uh, what are you doing with it you, you have to check it away okay? it's a disposable battery okay? uh and then of course you have uh, the secondary battery you know which is a a, a rechargeable um, battery and uh, obviously in many ways uh, rechargeable batteries are uh, good because the problem of waste generation uh, is uh, much lower because it may last you for a few years uh, rather than uh, you know lasting for a month and i'm having to put another uh, battery 
may be a burning of coal to get electricity and recharging the battery may be a safer option uh, than uh, chucking away the battery and uh, producing another or using another battery okay. so so those are the primary and secondary uh, batteries and earlier uh, you know all batteries were effectively water based you know aqueous electrolyte batteries okay. and uh, uh, so you you take the lead acid battery it would have uh, sulfuric acid as the electrolyte you know uh, there are many others where you'll find an uh, alkali paste uh, which is used as the electrolyte okay so they are all uh, aqueous electrolyte batteries uh, now in recent years you can actually uh, increase and put in another column uh, which will be uh, uh, solid state batteries absolutely solid state there's no water or no solvent okay? uh, in fact the people who are uh, probably farthest ahead uh, is taiwan you know uh, they they've developed some uh, good technology in that uh, area okay uh, and so you know that would be great uh, almost like uh, the equivalent of uh, uh, solar photovoltaics but then if you really want to get very high power okay and uh, very high energy uh, density uh, then of course you know you need to look at redox potentials okay which are very very strongly favorable for that you know? like for example if i have got uh something which is extremely electropositive which is the most electropositive element sodium yeah right like, uh, you know lithium sodium you know uh, would be examples of things which always would like to ex uh, exist in the plus state i mean so if you take the metallic form uh, obviously it would like to uh, release an electron and go into the uh, metal plus form okay uh, so those are Uh, obviously you you derive a very favorable oxidation potential uh, for that you know? and likewise uh, what would be a very favorable uh, uh, let's say which is very strongly electronegative fluorine or chlorine absolutely you know so you can imagine that if you could have made a battery hypothetically let's not worry about how to make it which had sodium you know at, at the Uh, anode and, and fluorine at the cathode okay uh, and and uh, let's say at the end of it i get sodium fluoride okay uh, you can imagine that there will be nothing uh, which can be more powerful than that in terms of uh, the how much power i can get okay because i have used the most strongly electropositive material and i have used the most strongly electronegative material now uh, what is one of the problems in using Uh, let's say an extremely uh, uh, electropositive uh, metal uh, in terms of the ease of use could i put it into an aqueous electrolyte battery so can you can you repeat no i'm 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 asking that like let's say uh, if i if i want to use lithium or uh, sodium okay uh, can i use that in uh, how would i use that if i have to have an electrolyte uh, what kind of electrolyte must it be can you use water no sir yeah you can't well, what will happen if you use water it will react with water the, of, the, on the one hand suppose i want to say i want to really get high voltage high power you know out of these batteries then you know i i cannot use an aqueous electrolyte and it was really towards the end of the 60s that uh, people started uh, being able to make uh, batteries uh, where the electrolyte uh, is non aqueous okay? because i know i i can take sodium and i can put it in an uh, under an organic solvent you know it remains perfectly stable not all solvents uh, but many okay? so it's not as if i cannot keep the metal Uh, even a very strongly electropositive me uh, metal uh, stable i can uh, but i'll have to use a non aqueous uh, electrolyte and uh, that itself became a challenge because uh, you have to find uh, salts you know, uh, which uh, which will basically dissolve in uh, non aqueous medium and ionize because only then i can have ionic conductivity 
right? Which are required to uh, complete the circuit. So uh, those were the issues that how do you generate uh, non-aqueous uh, systems with high uh, ionic conductivity? You know? So so I, I hope you can uh, uh, understand the issues uh, involved. Has everybody understood? Everybody is clear? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Considering these things, it was this company, Matsushita, which uh, started working on a lithium battery way back around 1965. And uh, you, know, you can see their patent. Uh, they filed the application in 1968. Yeah? And uh, I think it was granted around uh, year 69 or 70 or thereabouts. Okay? But I hope you can see uh, that there are people who can see far ahead in the mid 60s they had already thought of making a battery we are not talking you know when people talk about lithium battery and uh, you you think that it's a uh, it's a very very modern day invention not true okay. the work actually began almost 50 years ago okay. uh, although uh, what they had uh, was a disposable lithium battery it was not a rechargeable uh, uh, battery and what the Nobel Prize was given for for the rechargeable battery. Uh, fine, okay. I mean, they they've uh, done something uh, quite great. I'm not denying that, uh, but uh, I believe that uh, the work of Matsushita uh, was very very significant. Let me uh, 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 first uh, read this uh, their abstract. I'm not going to uh, uh, you know read the entire uh, patent, but I thought. Uh, the abstract is so beautifully written uh, that more or less uh, summarizes everything. Uh, but uh, it actually, uh, in terms of a concept, yeah, uh, it's not miles away from what we uh, discussed. You know that if I take, uh, let's say, when I told you that if you take the most electropositive uh, element and you take the most electronegative element, and obviously uh, the overall uh, Cell potential for that would be the highest. I'm sure that was the kind of idea which was in their mind. Uh, and 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 but they probably didn't know how to get there in a straightforward manner that I can take uh, fluorine and uh, lithium. They knew how to take lithium metal. Uh, the fluorine part of it was uh, uh, less clear to them. Okay, uh, but it's interesting that uh, they actually carried out. Uh, uh, electrochemical uh, reaction, you know, uh, where uh, lithium fluoride was formed. Okay? Uh, and this patent uh, teaches uh, how to conceive. Uh, it's something that uh, we are not really uh, very good at. I would strongly advise you to also look at that. Wanting to improve something is great. Okay? Uh, but I think that uh, uh, some of you. Uh, at least should try and aspire okay, to conceptualize. You know? And conceptualization uh, will come for people like you all. You all are the smartest people. Okay? If you all don't conceive, then who is going to conceive? Okay? In the majority of places, you don't find uh, breakthrough conceptions. Okay? What you find is perfection, another route, uh, all that kind of stuff is there. Okay? But not the conception of a of a brand new idea. So uh, look at the uh, kind of conception, and I'll read out uh, what they have done. Uh, uh, electric current producing primary cell. So primary cell. Uh, so it's not a rechargeable uh, uh, battery that they're talking about. Of high energy density, which is composed of a negative electrode having a light metal as active material. In other words, he's talking about lithium. A non aqueous electrolyte. Okay, so very, very important because otherwise uh, those uh, kinds of active materials will, uh, will not sustain uh, in an aqueous uh, environment. Okay? That's something that uh, uh, you need to uh, also look at. A non aqueous electrolyte and a positive electrode means the cathode okay? yeah. having a solid fluorinated carbon as active material. Okay. 
Now, this is quite incredible. You know, the, their conception was that uh, we know that graphite is used, for example, as an uh, as a uh, as an electrode. You know, uh, you can use it uh, depending on the situation, either as the anode or the cathode. You know. They're talking of the cathode, but they were not using just a plain graphite. What they did uh, was they fluorinated uh, the graphite. Okay, and so they effectively converted it into a uh, something like this C F X N. Okay. So uh, graphite, of course, is all uh, just carbon. Okay, but some of the uh, uh, fluorines, you know, uh, were introduced into into that. Okay, uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, by taking uh, uh, the the pi electron uh, uh, cloud, you know, in the graphite and uh, utilizing that to introduce uh, uh, fluorine. Okay, and uh, so they they did that something between. Uh, 0 0.5 to 1 was the stoichiometric uh, equivalent of uh, fluoride to carbon. Okay? And, uh, and uh, that's what they did. Okay? Let's read it. Where, wherein x is not smaller than 0 0.5, but not larger than 1, and obtained by the fluorination of a crystalline carbon, such as graphite, and which has such advantages that the utility of the positive electrode active material is high and nearly 100%, okay? that the flat characteristic of discharge voltage is excellent and that the shelf life is long owing to the chemical stability in the electrolyte of the fluorinated carbon used as active material. Okay? So the, the, the electrolyte did not interfere with that uh, uh, with the graphite, you know, the fluorinated uh, graphite. Now, each of these uh, phrases over here is of profound importance, you know. Uh, I mean, and uh, let, let me uh, go through uh, one by one. He says, a positive electrode active material is high and nearly 100% utility. So he, he took an anode, you know, which was lithium. Okay? And effectively is saying that all of the lithium gets converted into Li+. Plus in doing a useful electrochemical reaction, which generates power. They achieved that in a very elegant way, okay, where they actually sought for an end product, which ends up as lithium fluoride. You know? Otherwise, the question was, yeah, okay, uh, but where, where will the lithium end up? You know, if lithium goes to lithium plus. So the conception was that if they have taken fluorinated uh, carbon, Okay. And I have taken lithium in my uh, anode, and this is in my cathode. When the electrons are flowing in the external circuit, okay, so lithium is becoming lithium plus, an electron is being formed. That electron is going here. Okay. And so what it's doing is that it is regenerating carbon and generating fluoride, F minus. Okay. Now, the the lithium ion basically travels from the anode you know, to the cathode okay, and sees this uh, fluoride there you know, and says, oh, I could not have formed a more stable, stronger product, you know, lithium fluoride. Okay? It's one of the most stable uh, salts. You know? And so that's what they did. You know, they formed a lithium uh, fluoride and that way they drove the equilibrium completely you know, to the uh, to the right, okay, and uh, you know they they probably ended up getting a huge driving force uh, for this particular uh, process. Okay? The second, as I said, was that don't forget I've got an electrolyte. I have to make sure that the electrolyte is not reacting with something. Okay? And in fact, we'll see later on uh, th this was one of the big problems uh, when the lithium ion battery was uh, worked on. And uh, so that was uh, another, okay? uh, and uh, you know, obviously that battery was very lightweight, okay, because they just had lithium, a very, very, very light weight. You've seen uh, with an atomic weight of uh, seven. By the way, I had uh, given you a question on uh, uh, on the role of lithium uh, in nuclear fusion. You know, just to show you uh, that lithium is going to be uh, required even for that. You know. 
for uh, for fusion it's not just about batteries yeah and uh, uh, and the the second thing uh, in a battery that you should have is uh, you want to have a very flat response that is you know the voltage okay must remain stable the output current and the voltage should remain stable so that i can get a predictable amount of power okay from the system i don't want it fluctuating okay? i don't want it going down over a period of time okay? so in a sense i mean it is like uh, uh, living a good life okay where from day 1 to uh, the day i die i am absolutely hale and hearty and then suddenly one day you are dead uh, and uh, in a way actually that's the best way to die uh, rather than spending 6 uh, months in the icu okay uh, and and so a battery also uh, ideally should also be like that you know and this is the kind of thing that they had okay they had a very flat response you know uh from this battery almost till the end uh, of the uh, of the lithium uh, availability okay and then look how precipitously it falls now that is really the, the one of the finest type of battery that you can uh, imagine okay and that's what uh, they were getting a very very steady uh, power output from the uh, from the battery and so look at the conceptualization in this patent you know starting from the use of lithium and making lithium fluoride uh, via the fluorination of graphite in the cathode okay to the use of a non aqueous electrolyte any questions from anyone is it all clear okay sir uh, yeah sir uh, like the there are three lines right so the first one the ma one marked as one that is for the lithium battery but what are the two no 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 actually they were actually if i'm not mistaken i have to go back to the patent uh, but all of them were different compositions you know okay uh, it is not uh, i i believe that all three of them were uh, this lithium uh, battery okay uh, and this is probably the one uh, which had the most optimum kind of a uh, uh, performance okay sir now the other very significant thing for you to know is that you know till that time all the batteries uh, their potentials were between 1 and 2 volt and there was nothing which was known which was uh, uh, more than 2 volt i'm talking about primary batteries you know and so you know suddenly to have jumped uh, to around 3 volts okay was quite spectacular okay now we come you know to uh, uh, what is uh, the invention of the lithium ion battery okay? but you know uh, it is really quite remarkable that uh, the work when it started uh, i think it was miles away from a lithium ion battery and uh, if you you may have just viewed it as very very fundamental research uh and it was would not be that clear you know, uh, as to what are the linkages okay? and so that's where you know uh, it's almost like being able to anticipate a chess move uh, which is made and for which uh, uh, you will actually reap the benefit uh, maybe after 15 moves okay and uh, so uh, that, that that's the kind of thing you know you can uh, uh, you can anticipate uh long ahead and there are some people who have got uh, exceptional uh, ability to do that okay so stanley wittingham was working in uh, uh, in uh, uh, oxford where he got his phd he was working with a metallurgist okay uh, peter dickens okay? but it was part of the inorganic chemistry group at oxford why because a lot of the material science Uh, really was about inorganic materials it was not so much about organic materials and so inorganic chemists uh, played a huge role you know in this uh, entire area of material science okay. now what they were working on was a project where which was supported by the uh, us air force you know and they, it was to look at 
the the use of certain bronzes you know uh, this is what is meant by a bronze tungsten bronzes mx wo3 okay um, and uh, you know they they were probably trying to uh, look at the catalytic properties of of this they must have had some reason uh, for wanting to uh, uh, do that now when they were doing this work uh, what happened was that uh, uh, england actually struck uh, natural gas you know uh, in the in the north sea okay and uh, so uh, us air force was not really that interested you know in the kind of project that they had funded they said you know right now it is not a uh, great interest to us but you know we have already paid you the money and you can do whatever you like with the money and so uh, what they started doing was that they said you know these tungsten bronzes you know they are they are uh, they've got a metallic luster okay and uh, so obviously there was an interest uh, in the whole area of conductivity uh, because you know that metals have a, a luster and uh, so so they, they wanted to study okay what was the uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, properties okay and they they found that you know these are very good they exhibit very fast uh, 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 ion transport okay and what was transporting it was basically the m okay so it was like a counter ion you know to uh, to this and and they found that these, these things are uh, they they also worked out the structure and they found that initially i think it was uh, sodium you know uh, which they they were working on and they found that these have uh, like tunnel like structures you know many tunnels okay or uh, channels okay micro channels and uh, the sodium ion is actually located in these uh, channels okay and it moves uh, in and out you know through this uh, these channels quite fast okay so so that's the kind of work uh, that they were uh, really pursuing you know, with the uh, with the tungsten bronzes now then what happened was that uh, this was actually invented by uh, the ford motor company uh, that uh, they, they were looking for an alternative to tungsten bronzes okay? and ended up uh, finding that beta alumina uh, has very high ionic conductivity okay? and uh, you know that was intrigued them and they said that oh great you know uh, so it it in a way is like uh, uh, the the tungsten bronzes uh, later on uh, we'll find that uh, it was a great man who unraveled the structure of uh, beta alumina and everybody thought that beta alumina uh, was just al2o3 of a, uh, a, a one polymorph of al2o3 okay uh, but it was not you know it was actually the whatever is very highly ionically conducting uh, was actually uh, sodium beta alumina okay so it was similar to the sodium tungsten uh, bronzes in in that sense okay and uh, there was a lot of interest okay in very very fast uh, uh, ionic conductivity of sodium you know and uh, good enough uh, was actually engaged in a project uh, which was called nasicon okay which was basically a sodium super ionic conductor you know that that was the kind of uh, thing that they were interested in okay and uh, so the beta alumina was of great interest to these people and one of the people who was pursuing that work uh, was uh, uh, actually robert huggins in stanford who uh, uh, wittingham had joined you know after he finished with his uh, phd in oxford now what is also very interesting is that the structure you know of this beta alumina okay uh, was worked out okay by uh, linus pauling you know that pauling was probably one of the greatest chemists who uh, ever uh, uh, lived uh, you may have uh, read his book the nature of the chemical bond and uh, pauling is one of the few who got two nobel prizes the one was for peace okay certainly one of the greatest of uh, uh, nobel uh, laureate uh spent most of his time in caltech and uh, so he is the one pauling who uh, actually worked out the crystal structure you know of 
uh, beta alumina and found uh, that these are like uh, layers of material, okay, the layers and with uh, the sodium ion uh, in between those layers. Okay? Uh, so, so that's the kind of uh, uh, structure that was worked out and there was a huge amount of interest uh, in the 60s and uh, 70s on, on beta alumina. Okay, then in fact, uh, what they did was they were not interested only in qualitatively that, oh, it's a great conductor, not a good conductor. Just like Norman Sutin, they actually wanted to measure the rate of the, the ion transport, you know, uh, through this uh, uh, material. You know? And uh, they actually made a completely solid state device you know, where they had two electrodes. Uh, which were the tungsten bronzes, okay? and in between uh, they they put this uh, beta alumina, you know, uh, which uh, uh, which was there. And what they were doing was that you see, so the the ions in all the cases were sodium. This was also sodium. This is also sodium. Okay, and the beta alumina was also sodium. You know? So the what they wanted to see is that suppose, like let's say, suppose I bias the the cell in a way that I have a, a more electrons going into this side. Okay, so I've got electrons over here. You know, so uh, now I need a, a competing sodium ion okay, uh, to to compensate for the charge because I I need to maintain charge balance. Okay, so uh, so I I need some excess sodium on this side, and since uh, this side. Uh, has the electrons have got pushed here, uh, so there is a, uh, a, a an excess of positive charge on this side. Okay, and uh, so you know some of the sodium ions can leave this bronze, and effectively it would be like uh, some of the sodium ions leaving from this bronze going to this side. Okay, and this beta alumina actually providing uh, the pathway. Okay, uh, because it's also ionically conducting and it contains uh, sodium. You know, so. And, and what they were doing was they were reversing back and forth the cell bias. Uh, so uh, once this was positive terminal, next time it was negative terminal. So and they wanted to see how, whether this uh, uh, whether the rate of the electron transfer is able to cope you know, with the frequency with which uh, I'm switching the uh, polarity of the cell. Okay? And so obviously at the point it's not able to do that. You know, uh, then I know that I have reached the uh, the maximum. Uh, uh, rate of switching, you know, and from that they could calculate uh, what is the rate of uh, ion transport, you know, uh, across this uh, beta alumina. Is that clear? Everybody understood? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. Sir. Uh, in a way, it was really a seminal piece of work uh, because it was the first solid state battery. You know, because I can imagine, uh, you can imagine that I can. Uh, do things in a way that I can create a solid state battery. Okay? Um, and, and so this was of, uh, of great uh, importance, you know, uh, this whole uh, area. And effectively, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that Whittingham got interested in. Okay? The movement of ions okay, across a matrix, okay? across a solid state matrix. How do they move? And how fast do they move? Okay. And what kind of structures you know, uh, do I need to make? Like, for example, I didn't tell you this, uh, but when they made, you know, the natural, the the original uh, tungsten bronzes, which were made by Wohler, you know, which were uh, really based on sodium, they were able to actually fine tune these structures. You know, they synthesized these solid state materials. And they found uh, bronzes which are most appropriate for, let's say, uh, uh, incorporation of lithium ion, incorporation of potassium ion, sodium ion. You know, so th they actually were able to devise you know, uh, different kinds of solids, okay, for different kinds of counterions. Okay? So that was of great importance also, and that was when I think uh, Whittingham uh, got interested in also the area of lithium. Okay, uh, now uh, then what happened was that once he had finished uh, with uh, uh, with his uh, uh, postdoc, uh, 
Whittingham actually joined the uh, the Exxon company. Okay, uh, and Exxon used to be the largest uh, company in the world at that time. It was not uh, all this uh, Tesla and Facebook and all. Uh, those days, you know, Exxon was number one and Mobil was uh, number two. They were the two largest uh, companies in the world. And uh, so uh, Whittingham was uh, invited by them. I think that Exxon had an interest at that time uh, in trying to develop uh, batteries. Yeah. Because uh, they, they probably sense many areas uh, where uh, fuels uh, uh, need to be that chemical energy uh, needs to be stored in a in a different form uh, maybe instead of a fuel uh, like petrol i can have uh, electrical power i'm sure that those kinds of uh, uh, concepts and ideas were uh, were going through their uh, mind you know and uh, starting from the work of the beta aluminas you know uh, there was a huge amount of interest uh, in this area of uh, insertion chemistry. Okay? And it is like, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, anything, you know, if I, uh, if I take uh, uh, silicon dioxide, like uh, quartz, you know, and if I were to substitute some of the silicon uh, with other kinds of uh, uh, elements, you know, I can create a uh, a, a charge excess or a charge deficiency okay? uh, is not very different from doping, you know, except that it's a slightly different uh, application of doping. Okay? And uh, many of the natural systems are based on charge deficiency, you know, starting with the most profound of all, which is clay. Clay, a lot of clays will swell okay, in water okay? uh, and they'll become fine colloids. How do they do that? Okay, because the clays have a structure, you know, where uh, I've got sheets of negative charge, you know, and in between those negative charges, there are cations which compensate for the charge. You know, so I could have, uh, like, let's say, uh, I can replace some of the aluminium with, let's say, magnesium ion, okay, or I can replace it with silicon ion, you know, aluminum silicate. Okay? So you can see. Uh, that what could be the kind of uh, uh, charge excesses or deficiencies uh, that you can actually create uh, in these kinds of uh, systems. Now, people also figured out uh, that these kinds of structures, as I told you, are sheet-like. Okay? And those sheet-like structures uh, were considered as intercalates. Okay? And uh, this whole area became very popular, which is intercalation chemistry okay now just to tell you uh, that uh, uh, in fact uh, you know, i frankly didn't know about it you know it was whittingham uh, in his nobel lecture who uh, says uh, that the concept of intercalation uh, actually came when uh, people had to uh, put in 29th uh, uh, february every four years and uh, uh, they 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 just didn't know how to do that you know and later on, uh, someone said, well, why don't you just slip in another piece of paper? And uh, it's like with what, one day, 29 uh, February. Okay, So it was like, I've got many sheets of paper. And between those, I'm slipping in one extra uh, sheet of paper. And that was actually known as uh, intercalation. Later on, of course, uh, intercalation became very important when people unraveled the structures of clays, as I told you. You know, and clays being natural materials, uh, they're so profound. You know? uh, clays have many, many roles to play. Okay? Uh, people started looking at intercalation in DNA. You know? uh, there are uh, many, many papers uh, on DNA uh, intercalation. Okay? And this whole area of post case chemistry, you know? uh, it became uh, quite popular. Okay? And it is all a case of uh, insertion. So for example, uh, let's say I've got a structure with a valence band and a, and a conduction band, okay? And I've, I've started filling in some electrons into my conduction band, okay? So I'll have to, like Langmuir said, I need a, a, a kind of a counterbalancing force, okay? And the counterbalancing force is that if I can push in, you know, some cations, okay, to compensate, 
uh, for this excess electrons which have uh, gone into my conduction band you know then i'll have a counterbalancing uh, force you know so uh, uh, but that means uh, that i must have things which are mobile you know, which have adequate mobility and allow you to go you know this way or that way if i remove the electrons my counterbalancing force can be again knocked off you know and i i take out the cation okay? so so this whole business it's okay you do it in solution in a solution it's very easy to see you know, how how you will compensate charges but in a solid it requires the migration of both electrons as well as ions which are much heavier bulkier you know and i have to look at uh, how these things are uh, moving around um no I, I just casually i thought i'll ask you um why am i uh, covering batteries immediately after solar photovoltaic sir if you are making energy we need to know how to store it yeah that's great I, I, give give us yes but there are so many forms of energy why specifically solar what was uh, sir because produce electricity from it so that to store that it is a bit difficult <laughs> can you be a bit more specific also sir in the solar energy is only available during the day time so storing yes, it yes yes absolutely so you need a battery at uh, uh, for the off solar uh, time some other reason additionally what kind of a power do i get from a solar panel is it uh, is it dc power or ac power it's dc it's dc right no so you you have a, uh, a huge advantage that you have dc power which is being generated okay and you're storing it in a device uh, where uh, where again i will be operating it in a dc mode okay so i don't need any rectifiers you know uh, for these kinds of uh, systems you know uh, that's one of the big advantages of interfacing uh, uh, solar photovoltaics with uh, uh, with the battery is it clear yes sir uh, you you remember i told you that whenever i go through this or whenever you go through you know or you are listening to any of this always ask yourself is there anything that i have ever done which in even in a remote way you know, has got some kind of a linkage uh, with the topic that is being covered you know? uh, that of course makes it uh, uh, much more interesting you know? now i i just thought i'll show you this uh, this is john good enough okay and this happens to be uh, alan ward with whom i uh, did a post doc you know uh, in uh, between 1982 and uh, 1984 okay and both of them together uh, were uh, awarded the us uh, uh, national medal of science okay which is the highest uh, 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 honor you know which a scientist can get in, in the united states uh, one of the things that uh, bard had done which uh, uh, became uh, much talked about Uh, was you know uh, there was a lot of interest in figuring out uh, how did early life begin on earth you know? i mean that was uh, of course a very profound thing and uh, you have seen the uh, the experiments of berkland and ide uh, where they used an electric arc uh, to make uh, nitric acid okay and likewise you know there was a very famous experiment uh, which was done by uh, Uh, the pair of yuri miller you know it used to be called the yuri miller experiment where uh, they had actually taken an electric arc you know, and uh, they had actually shown that under some conditions they are able to produce amino acids you know? uh, so that was a very famous experiment and people said maybe that's how amino acids were generated on earth you know uh, from the electric arc and the nitrogen in the atmosphere you know so a huge amount of interest you know was there on uh, in the yuri miller experiment now bard at that time uh, was able to use semiconductor electrodes you know, and he used light he used uh, 
uh, ultraviolet uh, radiation, not an electric uh, arc, and was able to also generate amino acids you know, uh, through, uh, through that kind of uh, a process. Okay? And uh, so that became uh, uh, extremely important you know, as an alternative to the uh, electric arc uh, hypothesis of uh, uh, producing uh, amino acids. You know, uh, one of the many, many things that uh, Bard has done in his uh, uh, life and he's about, what, about 87 years old now. You know? So uh, he's still very active you know, as a scientist. Okay? And uh, now, around that time, there was another uh, very interesting paper uh, which was published by this German person, Armin Weiss. Okay? And uh, Armin Weiss uh, had uh, proposed, you know, uh, that uh, maybe uh, life began, uh, the synthesis of these amino acids and all, uh, actually began on in clays. Okay? Uh, and in fact, you know, it resonated very well with uh, uh, some of the literature, you know, the religious uh, literature where people would say that uh, life originated on in clays. Okay? And uh, so there was a huge amount of interest, you know, in... Uh, in the work of uh, Armin Weiss. And when I joined the uh, uh, part, he gave me this paper of Armin Weiss and said, uh, uh, Pushkita, just see if you can do uh, something with clays. And uh, you know, I was just, and usually, you know, that's about the kind of uh, advice that you'll get. You're not going to be spoon fed uh, with, uh, now you can do this, you can do that. You, know? uh, you have to then, uh, go and see, figure out uh, what you might do. And I thought, I'm in an electrochemistry lab, you know, it's a very famous uh, lab of bards, and uh, uh, and I, I was aware that uh, uh, the clays have got this uh, ion exchanging ability, you know, which I uh, told you about uh, because of the uh, particular structures that they have. And so, you know, I thought that uh, maybe uh, I could, uh, maybe coat uh, electrodes with uh, with clay okay and uh, maybe put different kinds of uh, redox uh, constituents in the in the clay and look at whether i can uh, uh, see the uh, electrochemical response you know uh, of uh, of these uh, redox species you know so uh, it it was obviously never uh, done before you know nothing like that had been uh, done and that work became uh, quite famous, okay? And uh, the first paper that we published was, it's called Clay Modified uh, Electrodes. You know? Now, what is very interesting is, you know, I was, when I was reading my uh, paper, uh, I do in the beginning, okay, uh, mention about uh, the importance of clays uh, because of their intercalation properties, you know? Uh, so, uh, you know, it's not miles away okay, from uh, what Whittingham uh, was interested in, you know, the transport of uh, uh, ions, you know, uh, through these kinds of solid uh, matrices, okay. This was also the, the same kind of thing, okay, uh, except uh, that ours was never done in a solid state. You know, it was always a wet system, okay. So these were actually put in... Uh, aqueous electrolyte and the electrochemical response was uh, monitored. Okay? Uh, but otherwise, we're just thinking that, uh, look, I mean, Bard was such a famous uh, uh, electrochemist, you know, we were working on intercalation, but we never thought, you know, of applying such a concept to a battery design. You know? So, I, I mean, what I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes, you know, you could be working on something and do you have the ability to look uh, beyond whatever you are doing, you know? And and maybe you can uh, you can venture into uh, a, a new and unknown uh, area, you know. Uh, but uh, neither Bard nor I uh, actually had uh, uh, thought of that, you know, at all. You know, uh, when we were doing our work, we had a very limited agenda, you know. But later on, I uh, began to think that perhaps, you know we could have done something interesting uh, along those lines. Okay. Now, so uh, what, what was he uh, doing? Uh, uh, Stanley Whittingham uh, 
uh, then ended up making uh, this particular uh, cathode LIXTIS2, okay, which is uh, you can see layered structure, lithium titanium uh, sulfide, okay, and uh, uh, so uh, depending on uh, the charge in the main matrix, you could actually vary the amount of uh, lithium. So if I write as TIS2, you know, that is neutral. There's no, uh, there's no compensating ion. It is titanium plus four. You know? But now, suppose, like, let's say, I have reduced the titanium plus four partially to between titanium plus three and plus four, and my sulfide is still uh, uh, S2 will require uh, minus four is the charge. So I'll have to, for uh, charge neutrality, uh, I'll require uh, some kind of ion to be uh, coming from somewhere, you know. So uh, that's what uh, the lithium does, you know. The lithium uh, actually then becomes a compensating ion, you know, when the titanium plus four is partially getting to reduce to titanium plus three okay, uh, to maintain the charge balance, okay. So, uh, and so what he was studying was this, uh, how, how does the, uh, the lithium uh, move in and out, you know, of this kind of a, of a system. And he found that it's very efficient. Uh, it moves out quite well and moves in quite well, depending on uh, how you're biasing this uh, uh, titanium uh, sulfide, disulfide, okay. And uh, so he conceived the idea of a, uh, of a cathode, you know, uh, with uh, uh, where the lithium could slip in and out. The next idea that he had was that, look, I mean, I'm sure he had the Matsushita cell in his mind. And he said, main problem with the Matsushita cell is that I'm forming lithium fluoride, you know, and th that cannot be reversed, you know. Uh, I cannot recharge uh, that kind of a cell. Whereas here, uh, what he said is that, suppose I take a lithium uh, anode, okay, and I'm oxidizing it, the lithium is becoming lithium plus, my electrons are going to the cathode, so my titanium plus four, okay, is uh, partly getting reduced, let's say to titanium uh, three, and then why can't the lithium, which ion, uh, which was formed at the anode, can it not become the compensating ion? In other words, you know, the lithium has to move uh, from the anode side uh, to the cathode side. You know? So it is just doing a shuttling job you know, uh, between the, and then what he uh, said is, now suppose, let's say I reoxidize, you know, the uh, titanium plus three to uh, plus four, let's say, and then the lithium is forced to leave, and then could it go, you know, back to the anode and get reduced to lithium metal. And uh, so the concept of a rechargeable battery, lithium battery, okay, was born. Okay? And not only that, because Whittingham was working in Exxon, you know, and Exxon was a big company, you know, and companies want to see uh, something practical coming out of uh, uh, this work, you know, then Whittingham actually succeeded in making large sheets, you know, of this uh, titanium sulfide, you know, and then he said, wow, I can actually now make uh, uh, a battery, you know, because I can make uh, uh, titanium disulfide in a, uh, in, in, as a large structure, you know, and, uh, and so the cathode material uh, for a lithium battery was transformed what Matsushita was thinking about in terms of fluorinated carbon, uh, graphite, uh, to uh, this kind of a structure. Yeah. Now, so, uh, and, and this is what they had originally as the, uh, what they were doing, you know. So I had lithium okay, uh, in, a, in an anode. Uh, don't go into the rest of it right now, okay. So the lithium is becoming lithium plus, okay. And the lithium plus is shuttling uh, to the cathode and it is getting incorporated here when the titanium plus four is partially getting reduced. Okay, so it's going here. Okay, and then when I reverse the polarity, uh, again, the lithium wants to leave. Okay, and it comes back here. And what they were hoping 
okay, was that it will form lithium metal. Okay. That was the uh, idea, and it it did. I mean, they were able to generate uh, uh, lithium metal uh, back during the recharging uh, process. Now, uh, then what happened was that uh, you see there were uh, 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 some problems. Okay, now Whittingham. Uh, even though there were uh, many problems with uh, uh, with the batteries you know it didn't prevent him from making the first rechargeable battery you know with that kind of titanium uh, disulfide and and lithium uh, anode you know and he actually first he he made small batteries for for watches you know uh, and in fact in his nobel lecture he says that even after 40 years, you know, these batteries were still working. Okay? Uh, so this was uh, small batteries for watches, but he also made, you know, a battery. Uh, the first battery which he, in his mind, he had an idea that he wants to use it in a vehicle. Okay. And because, you know, Exxon, uh, after all, are in the business of petroleum, you know, and uh, so their interest would be vehicle, you know, if the uh, if you can instead of taking uh, petrol, if you can have a battery, you know, uh, then that would be great, you know. So I'm sure uh, that was the reason why they were interested. Uh, he did not really uh, run a car with this battery. It was not that powerful, but he was able to run, like for example, the headlights, you know, of the of the car uh, with this kind of a. Uh, a battery, but nonetheless, and you can see 1977. Uh, you know, almost we are, we are talking about what 23 and 20 to 45 years ago okay, uh, that uh, uh, this battery was uh, made by him. Okay, and uh, now, but there were certain deficiencies in this battery, and which I'll talk about, which were recognized by good enough. Okay? And one of those deficiencies was that the voltage you know uh, which you could get from this kind of a battery was around 2 volts or thereabouts you know and 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 you know the people thought that what's so great about that i mean there are uh, like the nickel cadmium batteries were already giving about one and a half volt uh, uh, power output so uh, really uh, is it such a uh, big breakthrough you know and and this is what uh, 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 you know john kudina uh, started uh, looking at okay and uh, good enough of course uh, was a very very good material scientist you know and uh, uh, so he started thinking that uh, how do i increase the power output you know uh, from this uh, particular battery can anyone tell me uh, how you might increase the power output or how how can i increase the voltage of the battery if let's say i take a lithium as my anode, uh, what kind of cathode material will give me a higher voltage? Well, sir, it should be something that we talked about, which was similar to fluorine, that the potential. Correct. Should... Great. Great. You know, what you're saying is obviously I have to make my half cell potential you know, more favorable for that. Okay. And uh, Yes, as you said, like if if it could be fluorine, I mean that's the ultimate. Okay, uh, that's not what he worked on because he was a a, a solid state uh, material scientist, you know. Uh, but uh, yes, conceptually, what you're saying is correct. Okay, that is right. Okay? Now, so let's look at uh, the way good enough approach the problem. Okay? He said, look, let me just look at. Uh, really, the uh, the redox potential, uh, let's say of uh, uh, of my uh, uh, lithium lithium plus, you know. Uh, so this is where I am, you know, in terms of when lithium goes to lithium plus, and the titanium sulfide, you know, which he was using the other part of the half cell, you know. Uh, what he said is, uh, you know, this is the kind of energy, you know, for the uh, for the sulfide based. Uh, uh, system okay and uh, so it, it, this this really uh, is basically your cell potential uh, the half cell potential for this and the half cell potential for this and uh, you know the difference between those uh, i'll be able to get my uh, uh, 
uh, cell potential. Okay. So what he said is that I need uh, some kind of a uh, element, you know, in an appropriate oxidation state, you know, which is buried much more deeply below. You know, and uh, so he 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 was he was able to conceive. Uh, of the cobalt plus three plus four uh, redox couple, okay, and he started working on looking at materials that he can make where uh, cobalt can become cobalt plus four, and uh, it can be reduced to cobalt plus three. So when I'm oxidizing it, okay, so it'll go to cobalt plus four. Uh, when it is, uh, so if I'm let's say uh, recharging the battery. Uh, cobalt will go to cobalt plus four, and when I'm discharging the battery, cobalt pl plus four will go to cobalt plus three. And because you know it is so deeply buried, because cobalt plus three, you you may be knowing that cobalt plus two and plus three are the normal accessible states, you know, of cobalt. Cobalt plus four is almost impossible to make, okay? and so. Uh, you know, but in the solid state, because of band structures, uh, you can actually have structures like that. You can actually access the cobalt plus four state, you know, which he was able to do. Once he was able to do that, and he, he, he realized that uh, if he if he makes certain cobalt oxides, you know, with a particular structure, they seem to have this property that cobalt can then exist in the cobalt plus three and cobalt plus four uh, oxidation state. Okay. Now, what was also great was about this was that when he now looked at what will be the cell potential in this particular case, you know, he realized that he can go from something like two and a half volt to about four volt if, if, he, if he succeeds in doing that, and which he did. You know. And so good enough was the one who introduced you know, a new cathode material, okay, which was based on not the titanium plus four plus three couple, but the cobalt plus four plus three couple, which is much more deeply buried. Okay? And uh, so that, that's what he uh, ended up doing. Okay? And this is what made the lithium ion battery more practical. Because now you could get a much higher power density. You know? The energy density could be increased dramatically by using cobalt oxide instead of titanium sulfide. If some of you are interested in material science, you know, these are the kinds of problems which are of great importance, but you have to recognize, you know, you, what is the linkage between an application and what is the science, you know? So, uh, uh, you, you know, this is uh, clearly a wonderful example of a use inspired, you know, basic research. He was very clear about the use. He wanted the, the lithium batteries to be made with maximum power. You know? And then, you know, he started unraveling the science, you know, uh, for that. And he uh, was able to basically come up with these kinds of structures. Uh, so, uh, so again, so this is what it is. You know, so I have got, uh, like, let's say, uh, you, you don't get a perfectly, uh, 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 cobalt uh, uh, plus three, state. you can get a perfectly cobalt plus three state. Cobalt plus three is very stable. Okay, so you can think of it as lithium plus cobalt plus three and O2. So the overall cationic charge would be plus four and O2 would be minus four. Each oxygen is minus two. Okay? Now, when I am oxidizing, you know, uh, the cobalt plus three partly. It doesn't go all the way to cobalt plus four, you know, but it goes somewhere between three and four. When I'm oxidizing, okay, so I do not need now all of the lithium because my cobalt is partly in cobalt plus four state. So some of the lithium will leave, okay? And he was able to show this charging and discharging of the cathode with lithiums coming in and going out and doing it in a manner where you could repeat the whole thing over and over again. The other very important thing which they had to manage, you know, uh, which uh, 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 you see, when I'm taking a cobalt plus three or a cobalt plus four or 
likewise a titanium plus 3 and a titanium plus 4 uh, there will always be uh, some amount of readjustment of these layers okay so uh, it it may have to come a bit closer together or it might have to move away from each other a bit so there will be some amount of activation energy which is associated with the corresponding changes you know which will take place in my lattice so there has to be some kind of a lattice readjustment uh, which will take place and if the activation energy requirement is high then i'll of course lose power you know in in that kind of thing so they had to basically design things you know where the activation energy is minimal. So while the lithium ions are slipping in and out, there is not too much of a readjustment of these lattices that is required. So uh, obviously, when I start looking at much more of the details of these things, that uh, uh, it, it gets extremely complex. If you look at it very simplistically, it's all very simple. But when I start looking at all the details, uh, then the design elements become much more complex. Is that clear to everyone? Everybody understood? Yes, sir. Now, here again, you know, as I told you, you know, the there was the, the, the two oxidation states of cobalt, which are known. I, I, you would have known it from your high school days are cobalt 2 and cobalt 3. And cobalt 4 is something, as I told you, that good enough was able to get in the solid state because solid state properties are quite different you know from solution properties of individual uh, elements okay uh, so uh, good enough of course uh, was able to do that and here again i asked myself did we do something quite similar not quite similar but at least which has some relationship okay. and it so it happened i happened to do a postdoc uh, with Norman Sutin. As I, you remember, I had mentioned to you that Norman Sutin was the person uh, who made the first measurement of electron transfer rates, okay, quantitative measurements. Okay? Uh, I uh, thought I'll uh, put this slide in honor of uh, uh, Norman Sutin because he passed away about uh, a month ago. He was about 96. I had done some work with Norman. Uh, where uh, uh, what happened was Norman Sutin and uh, became uh, not only very famous because of all his work on uh, electron transfer rates, you know, uh, but there was a time in the mid 70s when uh, Norman Sutin and this uh, lady Carol Kreutz, uh, they had claimed uh, that if you just take this compound, ruthenium trisbipyridine with a 3 plus uh, oxidation state, ruthenium 3, and just put it in water, uh, that it liberates oxygen. And that was of huge interest because it was, it was very important because people realized if it really gave oxygen, uh, people also knew how to take ruthenium 2 and with the presence of light to convert it into ruthenium 3 and to generate hydrogen. So then it would be fantastic because you might be able to generate both hydrogen and oxygen uh, through this kind of a process. Okay. And I, I joined the group and uh, uh, I soon found out uh, that they had made a mistake okay. uh, and they were not getting oxygen. I mean, uh, that became very clear to me. But when I looked at the spectrum of this, uh, it was very clear that actually the bulk of it is forming ruthenium 2. There's no question about it. You know? And then it became a mysterious puzzle to solve that how was it getting reduced if it, and it didn't form hydrogen peroxide either. So neither hydrogen peroxide nor oxygen, uh, but the compound is getting reduced in water. So what was getting oxidized? You know? And uh, and I, and I found out that it was really the ligands uh, which were getting chewed up and they were getting oxidized all the way in some cases to carbon dioxide and providing all the electrons that are required to reduce the rest of the ruthenium 3 plus into ruthenium 2. But around that time, uh, there was a person in Russia uh, by the name of Strelitz who had shown that actually sutin and all were not 
that wrong. That if he just puts in a trace amount of cobalt ions, cobalt 2 plus, into this, indeed it forms oxygen. It could be that there was some kind of a cobalt contamination in the experiments which uh, Sutin and Kreutz had uh, done, and that's why they got oxygen. Maybe it wasn't a wrong result in that sense, uh, but it could be a, a something that happened because of uh, contamination. So what happened was that we were looking very deeply at what is the difference in the mechanism? What can cobalt do, okay? uh, which uh, uh, to to generate oxygen? You know, and it was an extremely fundamental uh, study of kinetics that was uh, done. Okay. And I'm not, I don't want to go into the details of that, but it's very interesting that in that paper, we had implicated a cobalt four species. You can see this is the abstract, thus implicating a cobalt four species as a crucial intermediate. And I said, oh, my, my, I wish I had uh, uh, had this kind of an orientation of a battery at that time, uh, because uh, maybe we would have... Uh, uh, done some work in the solid state. What I'm saying is all the time ask yourself, you know, whether you can shift your knowledge okay, uh, a little bit or think a bit laterally you know, from whatever you're doing, you might actually come to very, very interesting uh, areas of research. Okay. Now, so what is it, okay, that happens in these cases? So, you know, you know that if I have got any kind of an electrode or a solid state device uh, with a conduction band and a valence band. And we can also define the, the electrochemical potential by what is known as the Fermi level. You know? So the Fermi level is somewhere in between the, uh, between the uh, conduction band and the valence band. And it depends on to what extent the conduction band is filled or unfilled, you know. So, so that is how you will move a Fermi level uh, up and down. Okay. So, what happens is that, like, let's say if I've got my lithium, lithium plus, you know, uh, somewhere here, the redox uh, potential, and I can define that as the Fermi level. Okay. And over here, if I've got my cobalt plus four and cobalt plus three, okay, then uh, obviously this is my open circuit voltage. You know? This is the this is what it is, you know, the difference between the two uh, uh, Fermi levels. Okay, so so that that's what you need to know. Now, why I'm saying this is that okay, uh, a lot of people have got confused uh, in terms of what actually goes on in a lithium-ion battery. So now uh, let us look at okay, uh, what uh, therefore was the first thing that uh, good enough. Uh, uh, did after he uh, was able to get his cobalt cobalt oxide couple. He took a, a lithium uh, uh, metal okay, as an anode and he took cobalt oxide. Okay. And as I told you, uh, depending on whether you are discharging, if you are discharging cobalt 4, it will go to cobalt 3, okay, and lithium will go to lithium plus. And when you are recharging, okay, cobalt uh, 3 will go to cobalt 4 and lithium plus will go to lithium. Okay? But the problem that they encountered in this cell was when I remake lithium from lithium ion, you know, uh, originally they started with a flat sheet of lithium you know, and it was fine. Okay? But when it formed lithium ion and again I reduced it back to lithium, the lithium was not forming in the form of a flat sheet. It was forming like cat's whiskers, dendrimers, you know, fine needle type of structures, you know, which were coming out all over from the electrode. Okay? And that was a huge problem because what it did was that some of that lithium was going and short circuiting, you know, the cathode because it was forming a, a whisker like structure and it was penetrating you know, through the uh, through the electrolyte and going and contacting with the uh, with the cathode and short circuiting the cell. You know, and in fact, I came to know this from Goodenough's lecture. You know, 
where he says uh, a serious problem which we learn about from good enough noble lecture is that there was dendrite formation during charging when lithium was used as anode this led to short circuiting and safety issues you know? so there was a huge problem okay and this problem had to be solved so otherwise the battery was great okay? i mean i could uh, uh, i could generate high power everything but there was this uncertainty you know of what is going to happen if the lithium uh, basically forms in the form of a dendrite is it clear to everyone you understood the problem yes sir okay now at that time another gentleman who 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 never got the nobel prize nor did he publish his work in a very fancy journal he published it in a standard journal journal of power sources okay and what this person yazami was able to do just as lithium can slip in and out of these titanium sulfide or uh, cobalt oxide you know yazami was able to show that lithium can likewise slip in and out of graphite you know? and this was very appealing because graphite you know is already an electrode material that people use you know? so what they said is that instead of using a bare lithium you know lithium ion uh, becoming a uh, uh, uh lithium metal and all this dendrimer formation okay that if for example the lithium can somehow you know uh remain intercalated inside the graphite you know, then maybe you know this kind of a uh, 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 safety problem uh, probably can be solved you know that is what uh, uh, was of great interest uh, from this particular work Uh, which was done by yazami now it was good enough you know who recognized the dendrimer problem and good enough proposed the third person yoshino you know who was in japan okay and uh, he told yoshino that why don't you see if there is a way that you can solve this problem of dendrimer formation you know and uh, and see if you know we can come up with a better uh, battery you know that's effectively what uh, uh, what uh, good enough fast uh, yoshino to do okay now yoshino uh, then basically uh, he uh, he probably knew about the work of yazami you know and uh, so uh, uh, he said well i will just take uh, the graphite electrode which has been proposed by yazami you know and i'll put uh, lithium ion uh, there okay and i'll take your cobalt oxide uh, cathode okay and see if i can make a cell out of it i'm not going through all of yoshino's work yoshino's work is a very very interesting work okay and i'll send you you know one or two of his articles but uh, i'm not going through it how what was the origin of why he got interested in batteries in the first place etc etc you know but when yoshino repeated the work of yazami okay what he realized is that yes what yazami is saying is correct okay but the problem is that every time you know the anode was getting cycled okay from charging to discharging it wasn't only a case of the lithium ion coming in and going out what was happening was that some of the electrolyte the organic electrolyte you know which has to be used right i told you that without the organic electrolyte you cannot complete the circuit okay so the some of that electrolyte and especially the solvent which was used in that the organic solvent which is used as uh, in the electrolyte was getting into the graphite and destroying the structure of the graphite it was completely getting degraded after a period of time and yoshino realized that this is not going to work but like bsl he did not abandon graphite just what did bsl do they knew that there is a problem with the iron the iron they wanted to work with the iron catalyst but the iron catalyst was not very efficient and so 
it started looking at how to improve the iron catalyst. Likewise here, what he did was he started playing around with graphite, you know, went into hardcore material science of graphite. And he was able to show that if he can transform standard graphite into a higher density graphite. You know, and so he started playing with uh, with the density of graphite and this is the uh, lattice parameter okay, and this density. Okay. Don't worry about uh, uh, too much of uh, uh, all of this. Okay. But at a particular density of graphite, you know, he was able to eliminate the degradation of the graphite by the solvent. But at the same time, he maintained you know, the mobility of the lithium ion. So this was a huge turning point because with this, they were able to then solve both problems. They had a very good anode okay, and they also had a very good cathode. Okay. And that was the ultimate thing which finally led to uh, the so-called lithium ion battery. So, uh, those of you who are into modeling, uh, this particular work might interest you. Okay, I told you that even when I was looking at the Nobel lectures of all these people, they all seem to be silent about the role of the electrolyte. And just because they have made a cathode and an anode. And it could be some amount of insecurity that after all, uh, this was taught by Matsushita. It wasn't their baby. Okay, and uh, maybe trying to pretend uh, that is not so important. Okay. And, uh, but just to show you the amount of work which is being done in this area, there's a paper in 2019 okay, of trying to maximize the relative conductivity of the electrolyte. Okay. What is the electrolyte? It's a solvent which is typically organic carbonates like propylene carbonate. And this is my salt, lithium hexafluoro phosphate, LiPF6, okay? And LiPF6 dissociates into Li plus and PF6 minus in the propylene carbon solvent. And so it maintains a complete continuity inside the cell. Okay? And uh, that's how you uh, achieve this kind of uh, uh, continuity of uh, circuit. Now, what was very interesting was they found that at an optimum concentration of the lithium hexafluorophosphate, uh, you get the maximum conductivity. It's not as if uh, you put more and more of LiPF6, which is the salt, and your conductivity will keep increasing. No, you know, it actually falls off. You know, and this was identified as the optimum. So that is how, in fact, uh, the performance of these uh, uh, cells is improved. Okay. Now, what was the final thing that they came up with in terms of what is really happening in the lithium ion battery? So, let's look at discharge. You know? So, uh, wh wh what, what is my charge state? My charge state okay, is this. I have got I took my cobalt, which is partly cobalt 3 and partly cobalt 4. You can think of it uh, that way. Okay. So it has got oxidized and those electrons moved into the, into the, the graphite. Okay. But what they have shown is that it is not lithium ion becoming lithium metal, but carbon, the graphite, actually develops a negative charge. And the lithium ion is a compensating ion for the carbon. Okay? So effectively, uh, and so if I am discharging, what am I doing? I am converting, I am passing electrons from my carbon, which is in an anionic state. Okay, It is going into my cobalt plus four, and the cobalt plus four is getting reduced to cobalt plus three, and the carbon, Okay, is becoming neutral. Okay? And the compensation of charges is done by lithium. So lithium is playing this beautiful game 
or once being in the cathode, once being in the anode. No, it's just shifting from one to the other. Interestingly, the electrolyte also has lithium. It's lithium except for a phosphate. So it's all lithium ion all the way through. Okay? Lithium is not changing its oxidation state. What is changing its oxidation state is the electrodes. So cobalt is becoming changing its oxidation state from plus four to plus three. Okay, carbon is changing its oxidation state in the range of minus one to zero. Okay, so the the redox chemistry is actually happening in the electrode, not in the so-called lithium. Okay, and because the lithium charge does not change all the way, you know, lithium is always remaining as lithium ion. Okay? That is why it is called a lithium ion battery. Is that clear to everyone? All right. So now the other very very creative thing that was done by Yoshino. You know, Yoshino is a practical guy, okay? and uh, he was working in a company. I'll I'll send you Yoshino's uh, lecture, not the Nobel lecture, but another lecture that he gave, which I found very instructive. Yoshino, you know, realized that you see what people were trying to do always was that they were trying to assemble the battery in this state in the charge state now you can imagine that in the charge state this is a very very reactive situation you know? why because this is almost like butyl lithium you know i mean carbon with a negative charge okay so it's very unstable and my cobalt plus 4 is not a stable state of cobalt is very unstable. You know? So both of these are very unstable. And this is the state in which they were trying to basically assemble the battery. Okay? The, and, and because of that, you know, many times there would be fire in the factories, etc. And why were they doing that? Because they just borrowed knowledge from primary cells. In a primary cell, what do you do? You only assemble things in an energized form. You know, and then it is discharging, right? A battery and then it becomes dead. Okay? In a rechargeable battery, you don't need to do that. You know, I so Yoshino was the one who realized, you know, that you can actually assemble the battery in the discharge state. Okay? And this is very stable. You can hold in your hand. Cobalt 3 is perfectly stable, graphite is perfectly stable. And after assembling the battery, you know, they charge the battery. Okay, and then uh, you know, the battery comes alive. Okay? So such a simple kind of a, a thing, you know, and the massive uh, improvement that came as a result. Second, even though, you know, I told you that uh, uh, the problem of dendrimer was formed uh, uh, mostly solved uh, uh, because of this uh, um, uh, incorporation into graphite and the fact that the lithium was not becoming lithium metal, but remaining as lithium ion. But it is not really a completely true statement. Some lithium ion can still become lithium metal and can still form dendrimer. And there could be a possibility of a short circuit. And the way Yoshino solved that is that he made an internal fuse. What was the fuse? He just used a very porous structure of polyethylene. Okay. And he introduced it as a separator between the anode and cathode compartments. You know? So under normal functioning, there's no problem. Lithium ion can move comfortably in and out. Solvents can move in and out to this uh, particular structure because it's very, very porous. But if there is a short circuit and it leads to heating up, the polythene immediately melts okay? and it fuses and all the pores are destroyed okay? and it becomes then just like a sheet and it basically uh, disconnects uh, the anode and the cathode. It, it's just like a fuse in that sense, except that most of the fuses that we know about are things which are on the outside and this was a fuse uh, that is inside the cell. Uh, you know, because uh, what you have to really look at is not all the things that have already been done. Okay, 
but what are the future innovations that will be required uh, in so far as battery is concerned uh, one of the big big areas especially uh, now that uh, they have been talked about uh, uh, so much uh, uh, in the context of uh, electric vehicles in fact i was uh, quite pleasantly surprised yesterday when i took a meru from uh, the airport to nerul and the car was an electric car you know it was quite nice uh, uh, getting a ride in it and uh, so electric vehicles are uh, going to increase especially in the uh, urban areas to reduce uh, city pollution it doesn't mean the overall pollution is going to go down huh? i mean the pollution will be just diverted somewhere else uh, but uh, uh, so it's going to be important but today one of the big problems with these lithium ion batteries uh, is that they take a long time to recharge uh, whereas you know it hardly takes any time for you to fill up petrol in your car at the gas station and so uh, certain uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, goals have been set you know in terms of uh, how fast the uh, charging should be uh, and the target is around 15 minutes one pipe Uh, to uh, charge up the battery uh, but then as you know if you try to charge up fast uh, which means that you are delivering more uh, current uh, and therefore the heat generation will be high and therefore uh, safety uh, uh, becomes important and uh, so any research will of course have to ensure that there is no compromise uh, on uh, safety okay uh, this is a paper that uh, i will send to you it's a review article uh, which has come out Uh, last year uh, and uh, uh, it's on uh, fast charging of uh, lithium ion batteries you know uh, have a look at it because these are the kinds of things that will give you an idea of where things are going okay. uh, another of course very very important area uh, is the recycle of uh, batteries because uh, once uh, battery gets spoiled uh, as we have discussed i mean uh, really uh, Uh, then you have to put a new battery okay uh, but then uh, what to do with the old battery uh, is important and especially in india it's even more important because india does not have any source of lithium okay so uh, uh, the only uh, lithium uh, that you can uh, uh, possibly get uh, is from the discarded uh, uh, batteries you know in fact it was reminding me i remember a long time back you know Uh, there was a very famous uh, person called uh, uh, KC Shroff, you know, uh, who uh, actually had started uh, uh, the Excel industry and many other industries. And we used to have a long chat and uh, we used to discuss about water and the shortage of water. And he he would tell me, uh, Dr. Gold, the only uh, perennial source of water uh, is the water in the nalas. You know, uh, that you'll always find. and so this is also going to be something like that that it will be the waste battery uh, which might be your uh, uh, principal uh, feed stock you know uh, and and that's important not just from a resource angle uh, but also from an environment like angle okay is going to be uh, very important uh, but let me also tell you uh, that there is a huge amount of work uh, that is going on to uh, dislodge the lithium ion battery uh and uh, of course in terms of resource availability uh, lithium is limited uh, whereas if you look at the uh, uh, sodium sodium is not a, a bad element to look at you know i mean it doesn't have the same oxidation potential as uh, lithium nor is it as light as uh, lithium but it's still a reasonable compromise okay i mean not a very high uh, uh, atomic weight and uh, you get a fairly decent uh, um, oxidation potential you know from it so it could be that uh, future batteries uh, might uh, be around that or it could be around fluorine you know uh, batteries based on uh, uh, fluoride fluorine uh, so again this is also very really interesting because we usually look at the electropositive uh, things you know the cations and all uh, people lay away, don't look at the anions but the anion could be also very interesting then i can tell you Uh, there is work going on uh, in that area as well 